I think everyone here has been through a few of these, uh, these sessions already. Uh, a couple of people might be new, uh, so welcome. Uh, we still have about seven more weeks of investigations uh, ahead of us as we continue to probe into the electromagnetic characteristics of the universe, of life, and of different uh, often suppressed uh, modes of analysis, discoveries that have been made over recent years as well as past centuries and millennia into the proofs that the universe is a one, that it's harmonic, uh, that the laws of the macro of the, of the large scale are in harmony with the laws of the micro scale, that the domains of the internal laws of, of human nature, that is a creation of this universe, that, are, that is part of this universe, as, as well as our intentions, our mind, our ideas, our passions, we, you know, we can't remove all of these phenomena from the universe in which they were born. Um, so there's been a, a very fruitful current of, of thought going back a very long time as we've been investigating in the last courses and, and will continue to, uh, which don't recognize the dichotomy between the objective and the subjective in an absolute sense. For my part, as I was, was saying before my, my mic cut out, my contribution to this discussion, um, I would like to tackle an element dealing with the question of life and is life something which is just a material epiphenomenon here localized on the earth, um, a singular case of, of anti-entropic growth, whereas the entire rest of the universe, the vast majority of the universe is dying and is mechanical and is devoid of life, uh, maybe just these, these cold rules. Is that the case or is life something more than just its material manifestations? Is it, could it be uh, said that as a principle, life exists as a universal phenomenon? saturating every part of the universe, but expressing itself in different ways, depending on where you are. The same question can be uh, carried over to another uh, immaterial or often metaphysical phenomenon that's not treated very seriously by scientists today of mind and ideas. Um, are these something which is just the phenomenon created as by human beings on the earth as, you know, and in, in our brains created by uh, synaptic activity? Um, in order to satisfy Darwinian ends of, of you know, permeating our, our, our genes throughout the gene pool? Or are we simply channels of something that has already existent properties uh, independent of us, but that are given higher degrees of qualities and of life and existence uh, by our willful utilization of them? And, uh, and this is something which I'm going to try to touch upon in a variety of ways, but I'm gonna do it by starting with some elements of, of our local world. I'm gonna leap in from, from the local world, the small world in this part of the universe that we, we inhabit into the broader question of the macrocosm. We're gonna look at some, some properties of the macrocosm and we're gonna jump back down to the, the, the world of the very small in the, uh, the cellular domain. And then we're gonna take it back again to the macro. So we're gonna do a little bit of a, of a bouncing around and I, I hope it's gonna be intelligible. I don't want it to be uh, something where people fall off the roller coaster ride. Um, and what I'll do is start actually with um, a point on geopolitics. So currently, we just had a, uh, a meeting, which is ended uh, between delegations representing the Chinese and the Americans in Alaska. What was very evident is that there, there are two, not one, but two paradigms that were clashing um, in those two days of discussions where on the one hand, we could see that China and the Chinese delegation were simply trying to offer the West a chance to work with um, other nations on the Belt and Road Initiative on uh, policies of development. We know that China is really um, currently driving a new system into being, and it has been now for the past seven years, uh, founded upon an idea of open system economics, of going outside of the current um, potential that exists in the moment by investments into mega infrastructure projects, high-speed rail, advanced scientific and technological uh, progress. Uh, we have pro programs for space exploration. And increasingly, we had elements of that coming out of the West as well. We know that Western governments used to behave more in alignment with this spirit back in the, the times of John F. Kennedy, when the idea of space exploration, investigations into fusion properties of the atom, um, and more were, were considered a normal thing to do. And finance, banking was tied to the creation of real wealth in the real world. Um, there wasn't the absolute dichotomies and schisms uh, between banking and morality that we currently live in in, our, in today's world here in the West. Um, so 
We saw, on the other hand, a very closed system view of belligerence from the U.S. delegation that was really not taking the time to have a discussion with their counterparts on anything that would involve mutual self-interest in the long-term scheme of things. We had a lot of accusations, uh, condemnations over Chinese abuses of their populations um, and, and other things with, uh, with, again, not a lot of common respect. We also had, uh, we know that China has is, is got a very tight bond of survival with Russia and both countries have worked increasingly together over the past six, seven years um, in a very serious way over development of resources, uh, Arctic development with the Polar Silk Road. And again, I mentioned the, uh, the lunar uh, bases, but you know, China and Russia have a joint program to have a lunar base built together in a very short period of time. Um, asteroid defense is another one. Um, that was there, and on the other hand, you know, we have Biden who recently uh, made a fool of himself calling Putin a heartless killer uh, just a week ago, which is, I mean, who does that on, as, as far as high statecraft is concerned? That's just the, <laughs> it's bad form. And it's, it's just a, tra it's a travesty. So <clears throat> we have elements of this, like I was gonna say, from the West that still haven't been suffocated. And we saw an, an expression of that, uh, that more open system uh, tradition um, embolden itself with the, uh, the recent U.S. Mars Orbiter uh, program that just involved a landing on the surface of Mars, which coincided with a, a Chinese program, which is very similar, as well as a program from the UAE to have its first uh, orbiter around Mars. This is something which just happened a, a month ago. And it expresses a very different idea that's not simply cold mechanical geopolitics as it has been practiced by Anglo-American systems now for, for far too long. So we have these two sort of ways of thinking, ways of behaving, ways of defining human existence clashing. Um, and many people don't understand really what science has to do with a lot of this. But that's what I wanna to try to get across because when you listen to some figures in Brussels and in, uh, in London um, describing the need for a, a new scientifically managed society going into the, the new system that will be brought online, they're talking about something specific. They're saying rightfully so that the, the last you know, 40 years of globalization of you know, each against all social Darwinism, right? Might makes right uh, corporatism that defined the sort of pirate system of the past 40 years. That, that is obsolete. We can't continue that because it just creates unbounded speculation. The deregulation creates unbounded vice and this is ultimately destructive. And that's, that's a true criticism. But when they say they want a scientifically managed society, what they're, they're thinking of is, well, what are the laws scientifically of the universe that we know of that they want to use to justify the transformation of the human economy and human political society as well as, as culture? Um, and this is the question of, is science really objective? Is it pure? Is there such a thing? And since science is something created by humans, I mean, animals don't do science. They, they follow their instincts and, they, and the, the beavers build dams. You could say that there's, there's technique there. They're, they're, they're definitely using something which, which is uh, structured and has purpose, but it's not really a science as such. It's not something which as Abraham Lincoln made a point, they can't improve upon, they cannot improve upon their creations. Similarly, the bee cannot improve upon the amazing structure that we find in the beehive of, um, you know, these dodecahedral, octododecahedral, you know, structures and, and, and hexagons uh, that are defining the architecture of the beehive. They, there's a science there, but the, the bees don't practice science. They can't improve upon their workmanship. So the question then becomes, well, which, which idea of the universe are we really advancing that justifies our human uh, behavior and the laws we define for human beings, both now and into the future? Um, so keep that in mind as we explore the thing I'm about to do a, a screen share of. Okay, so can everybody see the screen share currently? Yeah? Okay, I'm trying to do a full screen, here we are, okay. So I chose to call this Halt and Arp in the Fight for a Living Universe. Um, <clears throat> again, the idea that I want to try to really get across is people often will say, well, if 
if the universe, if we want a scientific management of society, does that not mean we cannot have passions, we cannot have creativity, we cannot have freedom of the individual? Because science is about rules, it's about laws. How do they coexist? And if we do have a, such a scientifically managed society, then must it not be governed by like technocratic zookeepers uh, that control the behavior of the masses that just adapt to the controlled environments that are created for them? That's not a very it's not a very beautiful world that anybody I know would really want to live in or should. Um, but could you have an idea of science and of law of principle that is in harmony with creativity, with passions, with our aspirations, with our freedoms? How, how would that look? And could evidence actually point us in one direction over the other when we look at the actual universe that we, we've been born into? So with that, there's a few things that just strike strike me right off the top of my, my, my head. Um, this is a 2016 article. There's many more like this, which this one uh, is dealing with new evidence showcasing the birth of suns, up to 3,000 suns being spawned per year um, within a certain galaxy, the uh, Cosmos 1149-4 galaxy, which is 10.7 billion years, uh, light years from, from our point of observation. Um, there's many other cases that we, we've seen coming online, especially over the past 20 years, of apparent suns or evidence pointing to the idea that new suns are being generated uh, from galaxies. That's an interesting idea. Um, we have also, everywhere we look, uh, increasingly, you know, turn, at the turn of last century, when telescopes began, began to become more powerful, we started discovering that, uh, that these galaxies that there are these things called galaxies that have these really incredible uh, geometric patterns that as we continue to look at them, it became apparent that there were, uh, you know, these beautiful spirals of different forms and they're everywhere. And everywhere we look, we started seeing more and more of these. On the small scale, we started seeing as well, not started, this is something that's been known for a very long time, that when water, uh, falls below a certain uh, temperature, it crystallizes in the form of snowflakes and each one takes on a different unique pattern, but they have the common universal properties of having hexagonal structures. Um, we have more evidence as well of architecture on the living scale where uh, DNA has recently, you know, been in, explored and, and in the 1980s, I think it was uh, uh, discovered that the golden section is something which organizes the, the wrapping of DNA. Uh, lengthwise and horizontally as you as you move across a strand. So you have a lot of cases on the big and on the small of order, of beauty, of harmony, harmony, of symmetry. And yet in spite of all of that, we're often told that it's all a bit of an illusion that really this is just your, your naive senses telling you that there are these things. But science has actually proven to us apparently this century um, that it's really just random chaotic um, actions happening on the very small. On the atomic level, you're just seeing random electrons, protons uh, moving around a nuclei and within nuclei, within an atom that have no order, no, no harmony to them. And it just so happens that luck should have it that in our particular universe that we, we live in, they happen to organize themselves in what seems to be an ordered way, but it's not really the case on the small. And on the large, where we might acknowledge some sense of order, we're told, well, it's actually just organized by decay and death. So these galaxies that seem beautiful, you know, beauty is just an, an, art, an artifact of, of, you know, the human experience. It has no real existence. And ultimately, they're organized by a process of death. And a recent National Geographic magazine had a, an article by a fellow in there, a pretty well-known uh, science popular writer who uh, just said it, I think, pretty straightforwardly. In August 2020, Dan Falk writes, physicists believe that countless billions of years from now, after all the stars have burned out, the universe will be a cold, dark expanse where nothing of interest happens, or even could happen. As space itself expands and matter is stretched thin, less and less energy is available. Over the eons, the universe simply runs down in a scenario known as heat death. This is just, I mean, a completely absurd thing to say, just uh, off the top. I mean, the fact that this is something which is not a fringe opinion, but is generally the expression of the consensus view in science today, 
um, should disturb us all. Um, the most dangerous thing I think amongst scientists currently that's preventing a lot of new powerful discoveries from happening as well as discoveries in political economy from being implemented um, deals with a hubris, a, a sense of self over importance of the sense of one's own ideas that do not merit that value. And when you hear people, uh, a lot of the modern scientists and, and building up to this, this little lecture, um, I, I got to listen to, to many, many hours of, you know, Stephen Hawking and of, of Neil deGrasse Tyson, the popularized uh, science popularizer and Carl Sagan and many others uh, talking um, about what we know of the universe. And this is essentially what, what these uh, modern cosmologists for the most part will say is the universe. All of space and time or space, physical space, which is matter and space as we know it, uh, they say we, we have it all figured out. The whole universe is organized by mostly dark energy, which is 68.3%. They actually have the decimal level. Then dark matter take up, takes up the additional 26.8% of it, while ordinary matter, and don't even get it how they, they want to define ordinary matter, but that's only about 4.9%. So they actually go into the decimals they're that certain of, of everything. And beyond that, there's nothing else but that. That's what we have. And that's what we have to work with. So now um, you're in that box. So that's what, we, that's what they say we know about the universe, despite the fact that we haven't really been very far beyond even the limits of our solar system. It's very only recently that we even sent probes that have penetrated uh, the limits of Pluto. Um, and Interestingly enough, the information that we've been getting back from the Voyager 1 and 2 probes uh, after they've passed the Oort cloud um, into interstellar space has already, just by that little information, overthrown the standard rules of, of modern acceptable mathematical physics that we've been going by and that these people follow. Since, for example, the idea is that as far as the, the Voyager, as the, the spacecraft moves further away from a causal nexus of gravity, the sun, it should be going slower and slower. The, the effect of uh, the pull should be, um, it should be basically yeah, going slower and it's just drifting. But in fact, what we found is a massive spike of speed uh, up to, I think, four times faster than should be the case according to the, the ordinary laws of physics. But it doesn't end there. This is just physical space, but also when modern physicists talk about time, another aspect of the consensus and Cynthia went through this really wonderfully in her first lecture on Leibniz versus Clark and the problems in thinking about science today that were even being dealt with by Leibniz's battles with the Newtonian school uh, 300 years ago. But time itself is assumed to be pretty much all well known and all we have to do at this point is just fill in the gaps, but it's all figured out. And this, this is really what it looks like. We had 13.7 billion years ago, a big bang happened, then we had uh, as we see here in this little diagram, a, a period of massive inflation. Before that, there was quantum fluctuations uh, in, a, in a small, infinitely dead singularity that exploded. Uh, we have a, an afterglow period, uh, which lasted about 375,000 years, which they say that they can know quite well, uh, followed by dark ages. Um, the dark age period, they say, that's where you get a little bit of fake humility, where many of the, the physicists will say, oh, but that's the period where we don't really know too much what happened. We know that in the first little microseconds, which can be traced back to, I think it's something like uh, 10 to negative 36 uh, seconds, <laughs> that they say we can know that for relative certainty, the beginning up to 10 to the power of negative 36 seconds. That we know for pretty, pretty sure we know everything about that. And that's the period where you have the creation of all of the, the fundamental states of matter, the four fundamental forces that were assumed that we must exist. And, uh, you know, all, you know, weak and strong nuclear forces, electromagnetism and gravity were all created in those moments. And then there's some weird stuff that happened in this dark age period. And then we have the modern universe that we, uh, we currently live in that began to grow. And this expansion has been going on now for quite some time. Keep in mind, there's a few paradoxes here. For anybody thinking, this model already has you presume that there is that we must accept the existence of a moment in time before which there was no, no time, no nothing. And outside of which, right, there's a certain idea of a limitation of boundedness, a closedness to the whole universe, outside of which, as we see, there is nothing. And that's something, again, which uh, is a bit of an ontological paradox. How could something 
come from nothing? How could nothing contain something, an infinite expanse of, of nothingness? These are, these are philosophical questions that are brushed off as philosophical and not scientific. So you're not gonna hear too much treatment of them these days. Um, so, but we're told that it's not like you have to believe this exactly. You're given some freedom, obviously. If you're a student studying physics, you don't necessarily have to assume that this is true. You're given, like I said, a little bit of freedom and, and you're allowed to choose one of these four primary accepted theories of how the universe began and ended. Obviously the beginning is indisputable. We know that it started exactly 13.7 billion years ago. That, that's the, that debate is over. Don't even go there. I'm, for those who haven't figured it out, we're gonna go there in, my, in this discussion. Um, but they will say the end of the universe, the future, um, that's open for discussion and you can fit your mathematical models as you see fit into whichever one of these four you'd like. And one that has certain, certain, some popularity is there on the left, which is the big crunch model. The idea that yes, we're expanding now, but we're gonna stop expanding at some, uh, at some moment. And then we're gonna have the forces contract onto a point of singularity, at which point maybe nothing happens, it's, it's all dead. Or maybe we're gonna have like a bouncing ball and another universe will be created from that singularity that will maybe have a little bit less energy in it. That'll be, you know, because any, any bouncing ball has a little bit less energy with every single bounce. So that's pretty much the extrapolation of the, of the mechanical laws of basketball onto the universe uh, constantly collapsing onto itself, bouncing back and, and collapsing again, which ultimately still has the problem of an end point where the ball stops bouncing. Um, and so heat death, <laughs> just in a roundabout way. The other two in the middle are, uh, are less popular, but acceptable, uh, both featuring different rates of, uh, of growth of the universe, of expansion, but expansion at a very linear rate. While the third one, which is a little bit more in vogue right now, uh, has the accelerating universe. Um, and this is where, if you really wanna get a sense of um, dark energy, because what is dark energy? And what is dark matter? You, you have to have a sense a little bit of like, what are the people coming up with these terms trying to answer? What are they trying to explain away such that they had to create these things? Because it's, admit, it's acknowledged that dark energy and, and dark matter were not discovered. These are creations that we, did, we human beings created to fit into our models to account for observations that we, were, we simply had from telescopes. Um, and different types of telescopes, all the way from you know gamma receptors to radio uh, frequency uh, recept re receiving telescopes. There's a variety. So what what's really going on? What what are they trying to account for? So for <clears throat> for dark energy, which apparently makes up again 68 percent, so it's pretty important of the whole universe. This um, is known as the invisible glue that keeps the stars and dust and gas together in the, in the galaxy. Um, so. If the universe is, is, is constantly expanding and things are constantly moving away from each other, well, that means that more space is being created, right? And if more space is being created, even if it's empty space, what they're saying is, well, the creation even of empty space, even though you can't create something out of nothing, they say, they acknowledge that, but emptiness isn't, isn't really, doesn't follow those guidelines. Empty space, if you, you can create more empty space, but that still requires, they say, a certain type of of energy to create that space. We'll call that dark energy. <laughs> There's a lot of it, like I said, but we can never actually touch it or investigate it because it's beyond the, uh, its nature is beyond uh, observation. The other aspects of dark matter, which is 27% of the universe, uh, came about answering the question, how is it that galaxies don't fly apart? How is that possible that, that these galaxy structures that we find everywhere are not, uh, are not blowing apart? So there was a, a certain recognition that you could calculate the relative mass. Sorry, I got people in the waiting room. You, got, you could calculate the relative mass of a galaxy by looking at the luminosity of the galaxy and you're able to see... Um, I don't really, I'm not a physicist, so I'm not gonna say that I can teach this or anything, but you're able to get at the mass of galaxies. Um, also based upon their redshift, there was a sense of their distance, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a second. Now, the problem that came up in the 1930s and even a bit earlier um, was that the necessary mass to keep, 
keep the galaxies together as we would see them and cohere was about four times greater than the calculated mass of the galaxies that they were calculating according to their luminosity and the, the, their rate of motion. So they basically said, well, there must be some other form of matter gluing the galaxies together that could account for why we see galaxies and they're not blown apart. Uh, let's call it dark matter. And we'll assume that again, it's 27% of the universe. There, there has to be a lot of it to patch up all of the galaxies and glue them all together properly. Um, another aspect is why don't galaxies fall into each other? Galaxies have a huge amount of gravitational pull. So there's so many very, they're, 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 we'll look at some of them, but there's so many galaxies, why don't they collapse onto themselves? To understand it, another way of looking at this, you could think about um, the earth and other planets moving around our sun, right? And people might ask, well, why is it that the earth doesn't fly out of our orbit, our elliptical orbit into interstellar space? Why does it stay per, you know, on its elliptical orbit as well as other, other planets? And you could say, well, it's gravity. It's like, okay, well then why doesn't gravity just pull in the planets, in, if the gravity is so strong, why doesn't it pull the planets into the sun? Why don't all planets fall into the sun? The sun? You, you could say, well, it's, it's, it's obviously the uh, angular motion of the planets. You, you have a velocity, you have a, a momentum of the planets that's able to override the pull of the gravity and thus keep them from falling in. Now, I was reading a, an issue of uh, Scientific American not that long ago uh, that had a, the question, why are the planets where they are? Now, anybody who's read Kepler, a scientist from over 400 years ago, um, they know that Kepler discovered the elliptical nature of the planets around the sun by looking at the harmonic frequencies of each orbit at, at its fastest and its slowest point on the orbit, its closest and furthest distance. He was able to discover a harmonic musical property. Um, also, he had a certain geometric understanding of, of, of harmony that was a, a much higher understanding of harmony than had ever been recognized up until that moment. Um, and that was known as his, his third was known as his third harmonic law. So Kepler demonstrated that they are where they are because there is a, a harmony cohering everything together and, and he demonstrated it and de developed three laws. So you can't really just brush that off very easily. However, um, in this, in this issue of scientific American, they did just that. And they actually had the gall to say, they talked in about 60 pages about the formation of the solar system. And not once did they bring up Kepler's name. And they even said that in many, in many uh, cases that there is no reason for the planet's orbits to be where they are other than some other place. It's all just luck. So that's just already um, a very fishy sign that there, there are political agendas behind the practice of science and what we uh, choose to look at or what we're told we're allowed to look at. I didn't mention this earlier as well, but another aspect of this is that we're also told that we can calculate that the entire universe's expanse, its diameter, is exactly 92 billion light years across, which is again, a little bit of a paradox for those who believe that it's 13.7 billion years old. And I'll let you think about why that might be a problematic idea, even though you might find certain uh, statistical physicists who have come up with explanations to get around that paradox. So, So that's all to say, okay, so we've got an idea. I just want to get across an idea of dark matter, dark energy, because we're, we're told this by people who have authority um, as an absolute uh, assumption that these have existences. We're told that there is a big bang that has absolute existence, that before that there was nothing after the universe dies. There's essentially, we're, we're being organized by a, a teleological direction of death, a heat death of some sort. And outside of this universe, we're told there's really just nothing. So all of these things, I just want to clarify. Also, black holes come into this mix too as a center of, I mean, these are, these are things that were, again, just like dark matter created to account for why galaxies don't fall apart. Um, and sure, there, there does seem to be phenomenon that, that impinges upon the, the, um, the motion the, the, that affects the flow of light in galactic space. Yes, Is, does that mean that we're dealing with these uh, infinitely small singularities in the center of every galaxy that we have to assume exists, which is just pulling in um, everything around it into, a, an, into an, event, an event horizon where the laws of, of macrophysics break down at this point of a very small Planck constant. Do, is this something we have to assume? I would say no. I'd say when you look at where they come from and what they're trying to account for and what they're ignoring, um, you don't really have to. 
And this brings up another point on this of the sickness in thinking in modern science. We have here from uh, the NASA website, science.nasa.gov, one of the lead scientists wrote an article where he said something I think very indicative of the folly, where he said the thing that is needed to decide between dark energy possibilities, whether it's a property of space, a dynamic new fluid, or a new theory of gravity, is more data, better data. This is, this is really not healthy. Um, as if it's just the quantity of data that is causing us to be confused. If we just had more of it, at some point, we would reach a bifurcation point where a, a eureka would, would come to us and we discover what are these properties of dark energy and dark matter and, and other things. Um, so is it really just data or is it how we're choosing to value the universe, ourselves, our minds, and what we're choosing to look at for data and how we're choosing to assume and interpret our data? Um, well, one second, just got a problem here. Where's my... Okay. Can I still be heard okay? Okay. Fantastic. So up until You're next... relatively quiet. What's that, John? You're relatively quiet. Oh, okay. Okay. Do, do other people agree with, with... Huh? Okay. All right. So... I can hear you I'll try to speak a little bit louder. Some of us can. Okay. I can hear you fine. Okay. Same here. All right, cool. All right, well, I'll try to, to trudge on with, a, with a, my bel canto voice. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we've all been assuming up until this point, of course, that uh, redshift is an embodiment of the rate of, of uh, acceleration of the galaxy's expanse from the Big Bang. Um, how do we think about this? Well, you know, I think everybody here probably has some famili familiarity with the, the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect is something we're told about even in school. We hear it when we, we hear cars coming towards us and then driving away from us and how there's a certain growth, an, an expansion of sound that uh, amplifies to the point that it gets to our ear. And then as the car drives away, the sound obviously decreases in a certain uh, proportion. And everything that moves in wavelengths and frequencies has this property. If it's if the thing emitting the sound or the uh, the the light is itself in motion, then if it's moving towards you, as we see in the bottom right hand image, um, as we have a little uh, galaxy there moving towards a viewer, then the the light emissions, sorry, then the light emissions that it's uh, releasing will be compressed to the degree. Uh, Based, proportional to the speed upon which it's moving towards you. And uh, if it's moving away from you, then it'll, those wavelengths will be elongated. Um, that's the current theory in practice in cosmology. That, and that's the basic idea you know, of the Doppler effect in general. What we have on the left-hand side is the simple uh, expression of three elements uh, and their absorption and emission patterns uh, from the, the spectrum of light, of visible light. And in 1859, it was discovered by uh, Kirchhoff that uh, when using a Bunsen burner, I think he was working with Bunsen at the time, um, when you heat up various um, elements from the periodic table um, and you shine the, the light that is emitted, uh, that is, is associated with that through a prism, you'll find certain emission patterns and absorption patterns according that act almost like a signature fingerprint to every single element. Every single one is different. Uh, isotopes have their own uniqueness as well. Uh, so each, you know, of this 92 elements have their own isotopes. Some have a lot of isotopes. That's a question for science. Why, why do some have more and some have less? Um, but they, they are all unique. So that's a signature. And that's a way that we're able to figure out when people talk about the chemical composition of another galaxy like Andromeda um, or another star in our so solar system or in another solar system. Um, that's the way they're doing it. So they're basically, you know, they've got very powerful telescopes. They've got specific uh, spectrometers um, that use this type of uh, refraction in order to get the, the fingerprints of every single uh, element in various galaxies. And there's a very good ap applicability to this. Um, however, as we see on the image for the, on the upper right-hand side, it gets a little bit more um, speculative when you apply this to the assumption that this also, um, that, that here, well, let me say something more. Okay. 
Um, early on, Edwin Hubble discovered that the, uh, the different spectra of uh, coming from different galaxies that he was looking at through his telescope were shifted to varying degrees relative to the, the, what we find here on Earth from those same elements. And what you have on the bottom um, is what we have in a laboratory here on Earth's surface of a given, um, a given element. I'm not sure which element they're looking at as an example. Uh, maybe John knows. But it's a, it's a given example of an element um, and its, its absorption patterns. Now, it, what he found is that here, well, this is just five different examples or four different examples of different stars or galaxies whose um, uh, signature emissions are being shifted a little bit more towards the red. And, you know, light we know has a nearly octable, like it's almost like an octave of a little less than 400 uh, nanometers representing um, ultraviolet light and 700 nanometers uh, representing red light, after which you go into the non-visible spectrum of ultra, of infrared and, and ultraviolet. Um, but that's about the bandwidth of visible light that we have to work with. So basically, it was presumed that the rate of the shifting was a sign of the Doppler effect, that other galaxies, depending if they're moving, if the redshift is very, very far to the right, uh, as we see on the top, they're both moving very, very fast as well as being very, very far. And that's one of the aspects of Hubble's constant, that everything that is as fast as something moves, it means it's also the farthest. So based on these assumptions, they were able to start charting out how every, you know, how far everything was and was moving away at relative speeds from some point. That point is what they did a linear extrapolation to, to, to say, okay, it was 13.7 billion years ago mathematically, according to this assumption. However, what if this assumption is not actually true? Right? What if, what if, and sure enough, if you're looking at some stars in our galaxy, in our, in our Milky Way galaxy, one might say, okay, maybe it's, it's fair to say that some of the stars are emitting uh, are, are blue shifting and some are red shifting based upon whether they're moving away or, or towards us um, based upon their, you know, that type of property. But to say that's happening for every single case of other galaxies outside of our galaxy is a bit of a leap. Nobody ever proved that that was the case. And in fact, even Hubble himself, despite the fact that he came up with Hubble's constant, even said, uh, don't assume that this is a, a sign that the universe is expanding from some infinitely small point. Don't, he didn't even stand by that himself, uh, even though his name is, is sort of used, uh, I'd say, quite a bit in vain. But what do we find? So let's look at what we actually do know. Uh-oh. Oh, I had here a, uh, a video of Andromeda crashing into the Milky Way. I'm not going to play it because there's just too many te technical difficulties going on right now, but it's a crazy video because one of the implications of this is that most of the galaxies are red shifted, meaning we assume that they're moving away from us. But for the few that are blue shifted, in including the closest one in our current, in our, in our uh, galactic cluster, uh, Andromeda, that one is blue shifted, meaning it must be moving towards us. And we have a video, I'll, I'll put this in the description box, uh, which is really well done of a graphic of what exactly this is going to look like. And I think it's like three, uh, 4.5 uh, trillion years, or is it billion years? Mm, I think it's trillion of the, the, the crash of the two galaxies and, and ultimately the destruction of everything, which definitely opens up the door to a lot of nihilism and existentialism, you know, because what's it all worth and what's it all about morally if ultimately, you know, we're going to crash into Andromeda and all be, you know, uh, destroyed, or if the universe is ultimately going to, be destroyed on, a, on an even broader scale. So just looking out into the Milky Way, um, what we find is that as we zoom into it, there are a lot of galaxies. There's just, it's, it's in, incredible to think how much is going on that every time we, we get into a, a, a smaller place of, of the galaxy, uh, of, of a certain part of, of the celestial sphere, we just see more galaxies. And this is just, some of the stuff here is within our own Milky Way. And some, as we zoomed in, we discovered were uh, themselves galaxies. This is a, an, there's something like a, the Milky Way itself, they say is approximately 
I don't know how right this is, but they say it's 13.5 billion uh, years across or 52 uh, light years across. It's pretty big. And they say that there's approximately 400 billion, 100 to 400 billion stars in our, in our own Milky Way galaxy, many of which containing planets, right? I mean, this is, that's just a humbling quantity. Um, I'm not too sure exactly how many galaxies are presumed exist, but it's in the trillions. Um, I think tens of trillions of galaxies are, are, are currently assumed, but it's tough to say because every time you get at, um, right. every time you, you again, you, you try to look at a place that has nothing to it. Like this is a, a small famous little uh, square of, uh, I think it represents something like, like one inches or one or two inches you know, like putting your finger uh, to the sky and looking at, at a portion of your finger, there was a certain very inactive black portion of the sky that everyone presumed for forever was completely inactive, had nothing going on for it. And then they focused with a deep, deep focus, uh, the Hubble telescope um, over a long exposure time. And sure enough, came up with this incredible picture showcasing that as far as you go, um, there is just more interesting activity. And just like the snowflakes, um, there's something unique about every galactic structure. Um, there's something also somewhat uh, invariant that occurs throughout them as well. So we just, you know, we know that there's just like a, a zoologist looking at animals in the biosphere. We know that there's certain types that tend to come up quite a bit. Here's just a few that are the more common galaxy formations that we find of barred spiral galaxies, spiral irregular, elliptical, lenticular, and peculiar. That's a strong, strange name. Um, but there's many others. Um, we're going to look at a few others. There's also the question of where do they come from? According to the modern, uh, the modern mathematical physicists who believe in the Big Bang cosmology, there is a, a tendency to, to assume that it's all random, that you can't say that there is going to be a, a preference for anything to be in where it is rather than some other place. Uh, just like those same physicists would say that there's no reason for the planetary orbits to be where they are rather than some other place. Um, we're going to see that there's some problems there as well. Um, one question also is, is this, are these finished states? Like, did they come into being as we see them and they're going to just die after being what they were for a certain period? Or are these different snapshots of a different, uh, different states of evolution of galaxies from, from a, a starting point through different phase spaces in their maturations into some process we don't know. I mean, there's so much we don't know, but that's a question. And even Hubble was asking that question uh, a long time ago. This is called Hubble, the Hubble tuning fork. Now this is disputed. I think there's a lot of debate around, uh, around it, but what I like is the idea that Hubble was at the very least looking at that idea of a process. It wasn't just him assuming that these were finished states and you know, there's a lot of other theories, and, and I think that uh, Martin in his upcoming class might touch upon this yes. uh, on Hans Alfin, uh, featuring some very interesting phenomenon uh, of laboratory plasmas that uh, Alf Halfen, uh, Hans Alfin and his students discovered, which uh, expressed certain properties of galaxies inside of plasmas moving and evolving at very fast speeds in, in nanoseconds but going through these, these different distinct phase, uh, phases. Exactly. And since our universe is made actually primarily plasma, I don't know about this dark matter, dark energy stuff, but uh, no, since plasma is a, is a primary feature of the universe, exactly. um, I think that you might, we might find that there's more to learn about the nature of, of galactic evolution in a, in a plasma in a laboratory than in a, a mathematical blackboard, you know? Completely, absolutely. So this is just one interesting thing that Hubble was looking at. Now the individual, the man of the hour I'd really like to introduce is the late Halton Arp. And Halton Arp is an incredible figure. He was a pioneer of radio astronomy. Um, he actually worked at, in his young career with uh, Hubble himself. And, uh, and he was of the old guard, the, the old school of scientists who actually followed uh, their reason and their conscience more than consensus views of, of expert panels. Um, he was at the top of his game and really, I mean, like I said, he was seen as a celebrity in his field throughout the 60s into the 70s. And he published something called the Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies, 
the last 40 years of his life, he was seen as a heretic. And um, I mean, he had suffered just like all great scientists who are worthy of the name uh, suffered under a priesthood that came down on him. I don't think he realized what he was up against um, until it hit him. Um, but he was uh, one of the lead astronomers at the, uh, the Mount uh, uh, Palomar Observatory, as well as the Mount Wilson Observatory. Um, in his Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies, he basically pulls together all of the anomalies that he found over the, over the years um, of galaxies that interact with other galaxies. So his main focus is not just to look at a galaxy and categorize it like you would a, you know, if you were somebody looking at a, a dead butterfly as a zoologist, you know, pinning a needle on them and, and giving it a label and a name. He really wanted to get it. What is the nature and the process of galaxies? Where do they come from? Where are they going? What's their purpose? And the best way to find out about something like that is you you see how it interacts with its environment. So we had a, an incredible uh, atlas, and a lot of this is available even still online. Um, and he was putting a lot of effort into, um, he found, well, let's just say this here. Uh, these are uh, some images of some of his more famous books. Um, the earliest one on the left, you have Seeing Red, which is something worth uh, spending the money on on Amazon and just buying it. Redshifts, Cosmology, and Academic Science. And then um, another book on the right. Uh, he was looking at quasars a lot. He found these were the most fascinating, uh, kind of like how, how Riemann and Gauss were looking at prime numbers as a crack in the system of Euclidean language to see a higher geometry that transcended the, the geometry we live in. Um, Halton Arp found the same sort of phenomenon and fascination in the properties of quasars, and especially how quasars interacted uh, in, to statistically impossibly high degrees with other quasars, because almost always quasars tend to be found with a sister quasar. They rarely are found by themselves, and they're very often found with something called a safer galaxy, which uh, itself is just a, it's a super active uh, galaxy. I, by the way, I didn't mention this, but quasars were discovered in the 1950s, not, not long, I mean, in Halton Arp's uh, during his career as a young scientist, they were, they were discovered as uh, radio emitters, very faint uh, causes of radio emissions. And, um, and their name is, uh, is derived from quasi-stellar radio sources. So they, 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 that's where they're, they're most active. They, so a safer galaxy, which often will accompany one of these, uh, these things, is a super uh, active... It has a super active center. It's like 10 times more radiant than your average uh, galaxy. Um, and they're, they're often statistically quite close to quasars. Quasars, what makes these so interesting as well is that they're uh, the most redshifted of all of the uh, intergalactic objects that are visible. They are the most redshifted of all. And because of, if we follow Hubble's law and we uh, follow the assumption of the Doppler effect for redshift, then that also means that they're moving at the fastest they're the most energetic, and they're also the furthest uh, from us observing them. These are just a few examples of some of them. So we have a lot of interactional happening across the board. This is another uh, quasar, Cygnus A. We also, and, and we find that even though these things are often separated by, by wide expanses, um, they have filamentary structures often connecting them. Uh, so Halton Arp looked a lot at filamentary structures and ejections of material from galaxies. Uh, this is not a quasar, this is a galaxy. And just to show this is a composite of several uh, filters of different wavelengths onto uh, one image, uh, just showcasing that inside of, despite the fact that you have this dense singularity black hole, despite that idea you have in, in many, many ga uh, galaxies, these ejections that are often intersecting with other sister uh, galaxies in their vicinity. Um, here's another, uh, image here. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention this. Um, there's a 2005 study that I think Halton Arp, I don't, I don't know. I, I'd like to think he, he must've known about it from uh, the university of Belgium, which demonstrated that, uh, when you have two adjacent quasars, you have similar, similar polarization vectors. So normally light will be distributed from a light source, like a candle in a, in a spherical wave pattern all around the candle. You'll have the same. Uh, you know, diminishment of light intensity as you move away from the candle in all directions. When polarized light, it's one plane is being emitted, uh, not an infinite amount. There's a certain like 
choice of a, of a, of a plane. And he found that for uh, quasars with similar redshifts that were near each other, they had similar polarizations. And additionally, what this, this researcher, Damien Hutzenmaker uh, at, in Belgium discovered is that as you increase the redshift every uh, 3.26 billion light years, according to his standard, but as the light shift increases, you have a rotation of 30 degrees of that polarized light. So that already overthrows the idea of a random distribution of quasars that don't have any reason to be where they are rather than some other place, because you have you know, this organizing principle, um, which is provable. And he, he found this with thousands of cases of quasars that were being uh, looked at. Um, another case that I found was interesting was uh, the ARP 105 galaxy, otherwise known as NGC 30, 3561. Uh, so in one visible light filter, you definitely see a filamentary structure in Ursa Major, but in, and you see it even more clearly in, uh, in the uh, infrared. No, not infrared. This is X-ray uh, spectrum. So there's definitely a trace. This is another visible light spectrum in, the, um, in a barred spiral galaxy in Draco. I forget the name of it. Oh, well, it's NGC 4319. And it has a little sister galaxy there, of uh, uh, Markarian 205. Now, it's not obvious with the visible light spectrum, but you can see when you go to the, the X-ray spectrum that there is a filamentary structure connecting the small uh, quasar and uh, Markarian is a quasar to uh, this other galaxy. Now, why is this, why is this so interesting? And this, is, this gets at why Halton Arp was seen as, as heretical, why he was attacked. Because in his investigation of peculiar galaxies, he found that uh, in many cases, these filamentary stu structures connecting two uh, galaxy f galaxies or quasar and a galaxy or quasar and another quasar have very different redshifts. So different in fact, that they must be, if you were using that, that, that Doppler assumption, thousands or millions of light years separated. And it is absolutely impossible that something millions of light years or thousands of light years separated from another source could have a material filamentary structure connecting them. Now, he didn't discover this in just this one place uh, of NGC 4319. He discovered this in hundreds of places. Um, if you zero in a little bit more into Markarian, uh, what you find, this is just Markarian, right? This is the small quasar there on the upper right-hand side. What you find are, are that there are three other quasars. Uh, sorry, uh, Cynthia, could I get the uh, power charger by chance, please? The uh, computer I'm using is about to die. I'm assuming she'll help me. Okay. So what you have there are three quasars um, whose redshifts are, and they denote this as 0 0.63, 1.26, and 0 0.46 massively different from each other, but they're all connected together in X-ray form. And, and that's very clearly visible. I'm just gonna run and charge my computer because it's about to die in 30 seconds. Okay, all right. Just say you'll be able to use uh, solar power in the Arctic. What's that? Starting tomorrow, you'll be able to use solar power in the Arctic. The sun is going to rise. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we're, we're back. The computer will not die yet. All right, good. All right. Okay, so, and, and I have to speed things up a little bit because there's a lot more I want to go through. Um, all right. This is one of the, the most extraordinary pieces um, of data. Um, this is a safer galaxy known as the, uh, the NGC 7603 that uh, Halton Arp um, was looking at. Uh, now, this is the visible light spectrum. It's uh, one galaxy and its sister galaxy. What makes this so, so incredibly interesting is that um, we, not only when we look at, okay, this is the X-ray. I think this is the ultraviolet spectrum, I believe. Uh, but when we start looking at other filters and we take into consideration the, the redshift, we find not only do the two primary galaxies have very different redshifts with the lower redshift being the larger galaxy, the larger safer galaxy and the smaller one, uh, 0.57 being its sister uh, galaxy, but we have also two interesting objects in between the filamentary structure connecting the two. Now they should be thousands, hundreds of thousands of light years separated from each other. That is not the case. There is a filamentary structure and this is 
why many, it's not a question of just getting more data to help us figure out uh, what is dark energy. It's realizing that we're ignoring data that, we're, that is overturning the belief in dark energy itself. Uh, when you take in things like this into consideration, it's, it's, it's clear. But these two little objects have even greater degrees of redshift. Um, these are two quasars. Uh, one, just getting more people. So these are two quasars inside. And in many, many cases, Health and Art found in dozens of cases, you found these uh, quasars existing within the filaments. But in most cases, the quasar is near safer galaxies. This is, exists in a very specific location. Um, this is um, NGC 4258 in the visible light spectrum. And this is the X-ray version of it. Now, in the visible light, you couldn't detect what was a, what was a general, generic uh, star or galaxy versus a quasar. In this one, it's, it's demarcated where the quasars are. And uh, you find that they, they tend to occur more often than not in, in statistically, like I said, improbably high or impossibly high uh, ratios jettisoned out from the uh, galactic axis within a 20 degree arc uh, in both directions. Here, here's another example where you have the, the major axis, the minor axis, and around the axis, you have the location where you find all of the quasars from the top and from the bottom of these galaxies tending to be spun out of. And these quasars, again, always have much higher redshifts than their accompanying parent galaxies. Now, the last point uh, that is, a discovery that was made later in Halt and Arp's life by scientists he was working with was that when you look at the redshifts of the, the galaxies all, that are all uh, visible to our telescopes, you don't just find a gradual tendency to, dis, to uh, lower their, their redshifts as they move away from the, the parent galaxies, but what you rather find is a predominance to see redshifts located in these particular uh, bandwidths of uh, 1.96 Z, uh, 0 0.96, 0 0.6, 0 0.3 to 0 point, uh, 0 0.061. You tend to have these harmonic uh, discrete occurrences. It's not just random and it's not just continuous. They tend to occur that way in like these discrete leaps. Um, this is also implying that these, these quasars are like seeds. And as the, at, when they're younger, their redshifts are higher. And as they mature, and as they change, their redshifts lower and lower to the point. Um, well, this is a, a quick uh, exposi uh, illustration here um, of one expression of that, of what it might look like. And again, a lot of this stuff is hypothetical. We have to, we need more investigators to look into this, but this is where the data is leading us. And Halton himself uh, commented on this, saying, when quasar-like companions are associated with a parent galaxy, they tend to be smaller, higher surface brightness, and show emission line activity. In quasars large enough, are packed into absurdly small initial volumes. As they evolve, they have no place to go except to brighten towards being galaxies and lessening intrinsic redshift with time. The important point, however, is that the excess redshift companions are in the process of evolving into more normal galaxies and it is the numerical value of the redshifts themselves evolving by steps into smaller values. Okay. So we have an idea of, a, of an evolutionary process and that redshifts might be intrinsic as Halton Arp may, always made the point in his, in his writings and his lectures, and you can find these on YouTube, some of them. Uh, he understood that the redshift quality or blue shift quality was an intrinsic property of the galaxy itself. That's more a sign of the physical space time of that galaxy. And that if you were to go, let's say to a galaxy that had a higher redshift and you looked at a, a galaxy with a lower redshift, you would, you would see it differently from being in a position inside the lower redshift galaxy, looking at the higher redshift one. If you inverted that, things would look different relative to the space time that you as an observer were located in. Um, in this mindset, there are certain implications for the Andromeda Milky Way relationship as well. The blue shifted Andromeda, which may not be moving towards us um, and how we, we standing in Andromeda might see the Milky Way. Um, would we be red shifted? Would we be blue shifted? What would it be? 
Um, and does that mean we're maybe not actually going to crash into each other and destroy all life as we know it? What a thought. So here I want to leap back uh, into the 1880s once more. So we, we just took a pretty big voyage. Um, for the next half hour, I want to just look through a little bit of something different, but the same. So just as our discoveries of galactic formations was really beginning to take form, we also had scientists in the 1880s, 1890s, really looking heavily at embryology. Um, the reason why this, there was so much interest in embryology was it was the clearest domain where we could investigate directionality in life. And many scientists were not satisfied with the idea of like a chaotic random mutation process in life that accounted for evolutionary processes. That is what the Darwinians were telling us. Um, the, the two figures I would like to look at today uh, embodied two opposing schools. One was the, vi the vitalist school of Hans Driesch, and the other one was uh, the school of, uh, what's his name? Wilhelm Roux. So the mechanic, the mechanic, the mechanic school of Wilhelm Roux and, and Driesch, both were, were saying, okay, there's obviously a directionality from a simple single celled process of potential in every single life. And we see an, an interesting directed process of, ev of evolution in a sense, in a, in a condensed way towards a fully formed organism. And along the way, we have the, this interesting complexity um, of, of billions, if not trillions of cells coming into being and differentiating at certain moments, they cells choose what they're going to be at an early stage. You know, a liver cell could be a brain cell. It's, it's underdefined, but it, 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 there's a division of labor over time at specific stages of the cell's development. What is it that organizes this effect? We're going to tie this back into uh, Halt and Arp's work. I promise it's not two separate things. So <clears throat> the, um, the vitalist school was of the view that every, the, the information of the whole is contained in the part and the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Um, personally, I find that that's more philosophically uh, coherent with my views, but there are still problems with Hans Driesch's approach. Um, he was of the view that, okay, at any moment, all of the information is predetermined, um, sort of like an intellectual, an Aristotelian intellectual uh, idea was, was being revived in his world that would be predefining the behavior of the entire cell's destiny, all the way to becoming a maturely uh, forming functional baby of whatever it is. Um, the mechanic school of Wilhelm Roux was like, no, actually, it's more just a state before and after that we can know, but it's all variable at every moment. Uh, you really can't know. Um, <clears throat> he did a test. So it, it, it appeared early on in the debate that Roux uh, successfully won the, won the day by taking an early formed uh, frog embryo. And what he did at, at an early stage, it was like a zygote or, or something that had very few cell, cell divisions at this point, and he burned half of them with a little hot needle. And what he found is that the other half of the living cells grew into half a frog. So what he said is, well, if, if the vitalists were, were uh, right, then that should have grown into a whole frog, that the whole frog's destiny should have been contained in every single cell. So I'm right. And it seemed like he won until Hans Driesch came up with a, with a good counter response which is he said, okay, no, you, you've screwed things up too much by burning the, uh, the cell. What he did is he, he took a baby hair and he cut the, the cells of a zygote frog, uh, frog embryo early on. And by cutting it with a baby hair, not damaging the individual cells, he then found that they grew into ultimately two whole frogs. And he said, aha, take that. <laughs> now, there's still an ambiguity. Um, the, the full problem of how this is all occurring, what are the mechanisms of growth, wasn't really resolved. Um, ultimately, Hans Driesch felt like he, he did his, everything he could do in science, and there was nothing left to discover. He, felt, he thought he was like, it was over. It, he, you know, his baby hair experiment proved it, proved it completely, and he basically retired from science and didn't do anything. But one of his students, Hans Spemann, continued the work. And what he did is he, he took it even further and he found he waited till a much more advanced phase of the embryonic development, something like 84 or whatever uh, cells had formed in the to the point that you could tell what was going to become the mouth and what was going to be, become the anus of a, of a baby. Uh, I don't know if it was a, a frog or something else, but at that early stage, he then cut it again with the, with the baby hair. And, but this time simply repositioned them and found that they, they took on new duties and uh, forgive the pun, 
but uh, but they ultimately grew by the end of the the development into a, a fully formed organism. So that that definitely put the uh, the points in the into the vitalist school. But there was a, neither extreme really had the rigor to, to go deeper because they no, no one was still answering the question. Well, how are all of these cells communicating? You know, you, you have these cells being born at incredible rates and then and then dying. And, you know, in the course of, of a, your average day of a, of a human life, you have something like 50 billion cells dying and another 50 billion or so replenishing being born all the time um, in our bodies. Uh, this is this is going on inside of a inside of embryos as well. So how is this communication happening such that the, the brain cells could know what the gut cells are doing, um, that they're choosing to then take on new new functions and forms. Um, what's that mechanism? And that wasn't being answered. And there was a big lull for a long time. Oh, these are the two guys. This is uh, Hans Driesch and uh, Wilhelm Roux and a few of the, uh, the early cells that they were working with. Um, okay. So this will take us now to Alexander Gervich. In the 1920s, he was a leading scientist, even into the 30s and 40s um, in Ukraine, in the Ukrainian Academy of Science. Um, he was a friend and colleague of Vladimir Vernadsky, the biogeochemist. And Gervich um, was looking at life in a slightly different way. So he was asking the same question of communication of cells. How does it occur? Um, what he did is he pointed two onion roots together. And there's a famous experiment he set up. Even though we couldn't detect, we had no instrumentation sensitive enough in those days to detect any light emissions uh, being caused by cells, um, he, he assumed that there must be something approximating the speed of light that would account for the distribution of information in, a, in an organism as it evolves in, a, as an, in an embryo, but also into life. So the elegant experiment that he created um, involved setting up an apparatus with one onion root, which and onion roots grow, grow very, very fast. So you don't have to wait forever to, to see the results. And he had one root uh, pointed downwards, the Z, and, and they both were designed to connect at W where the 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 uh, the onion Z1 versus Z2, which is pointed downwards. Z1 was 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 set up to grow horizontally towards the already existing onion root uh, at W. And what he found is that is as the the onion root the got closer and closer to the second onion root when the stem started getting close to it, there was a thirty percent increase of cell growth in the older root that was pointed downwards, the Z2 root at W. What would account for that? Why would there be a 30% increase of uh, cell growth in the, the, the vertical root when it was close to the root? And so he, had, he, he set his mind to work on what mechanisms could be accounting for this. Um, and he tried different filters to block out different spectrums of radiation um, from a visible light first, nothing changed. Um, and when he, when he blocked out ultraviolet light, when he had an ultraviolet lens, which is, I think, a uh, regular glass, actually, uh, that was designed to block out ultraviolet light, all of a sudden, he stopped getting that effect. So by, by realize, he zeroed in that it must be some form of light in the ultraviolet spectrum, which was ultra weak because sensors that he had available to him could not detect it. It must be what is being created by the new, uh, the new cells mitosising inside of the onion root that was inducing an effect on its neighbor that it wasn't physically connected to. And that just created a scandal. Just in many ways, like Halton Arp's work created a scandal, so too did this. And um, Jonathan Tenenbaum, I, I found actually a piece of uh, work that he had done uh, from the 90s, where he had um, worked with a scientist who I'm gonna introduce um, a little bit. And they visited, um, the offices of a, of a very old scientist named uh, A. Holiander. At the time, he, Holiander was assigned by, he was a Rockefeller funded scientist assigned from the US to go and do uh, repeatable experiments of Ger the Gervich root experiment and bungled them intentionally to produce negative results. Um, Gervich was embarrassed, humiliated, or I mean, I don't know if he was humiliated, but th that was their effort. And he was treated like a quack. And for decades after he died, he, he literally, he couldn't, he couldn't really even teach. The, the last couple of years of his life, he was giving lectures from his bedroom to his daughter 
and uh, Michael Lipkin, who is uh, one of his students, uh, and one other person. But he was basically giving tiny little lectures on mitogenic radiation is what he called it, uh, to groups in his home because he couldn't get work anywhere else. Um, and after he died again, it was many years before his work was picked up again uh, by other scientists. Um, he did, there's many more other aspects of his work as well, which I'm not going to go into here, but he had developed, much like Vernotsky developed, um, a nested phase space of biotic, abiotic, and noetic uh, processes uh, in the cosmos. Um, Gervich developed a nested phase space of different types of metagenetic fields from the large-scale organic, uh, 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 organismic to the cellular to the microcellular levels. Um, there's a, a huge body of work um, that's just incredible from what I've looked at. Um, and again, I'm not a scientist, so I can't I, I can't access the understanding of a lot of the more in-depth papers. But from what I've seen conceptually, it's incredible. Um, there's another figure actually. Um, actually, no. Let's, yeah, I'll just say this right now. I, I don't have a slide on him, but there's a, a Russian scientist named uh, uh, Berkolov who in the 1970s rediscovered Gervich's work. And Gervich's work went through a bit of a renaissance in the early 70s. Uh, today, it's again suppressed and not, not very well known. But uh, Berkolov took this to a new level. And by this time, they had equipment that was refined enough to be able to, to detect and measure the different frequencies of ultraviolet light emissions. Um, so they knew that now this existed. Unfortunately, uh, Gervich did not get to ex uh, see this in his lifetime. But what he did, um, Berkolov, is he set up two um, batches of, of little baby fish embryos close to each other and separated by, by only a little plane of glass that would emit ultraviolet light. What he found is that if the embryos of an older batch were within a certain uh, bandwidth of age to a younger batch of, of fish eggs and they were brought into proximity, that the ultraviolet light emissions would radiate upon the younger the younger group, and the younger group would accelerate their development and at a very at a significantly high speed, and and hatch much much more quickly. Um, the caveat was that if the the younger batch was younger below the certain bandwidth, the healthy bandwidth relative to the older older group, then the uh, light emissions being caused from both would interfere negatively. And the younger group would develop, uh, would either die or develop mutations. So it just showed you that there was a certain healthy bandwidth of frequency uh, to these ultra weak photon emissions. And the other person who I, I think is just outstanding, or there's two that I, I'd like to just touch upon, um, is Fritz Pop, Fritz Albert Pop, and Dr. Luc Montaigne. Um, Fritz Albert Pop recently passed away. But he, again, just like Montaigne, uh, made prestigious breakthroughs in virology. Uh, Fritz Pop also uh, was at the head of the team that discovered the cancerogenic uh, properties of, of uh, cigarettes. So he was looking at two aspects, two different uh, molecules of benzpyrene. Uh, one is labeled 3,4 and the other one, 1, 2, both contained in nicotine. Um, in coal tar, basically it's found in coal tar and in cigarette smoke. Um, they're both very similar, but they have slight differences, different, slightly different chiralities. Um, so as, as I write here, the only major difference between them is that uh, the 3-4 bit benzpyrene has a strong absorption emission anomaly in the ultraviolet area of the spectrum. And he asked himself, could these optical properties of the molecule be the direct cause of its carcinogenicity? So is that it? And, and what he actually narrowed down, he discovered is that, yes, um, when you have the benzpyrene 3,4 in proximity to healthy cells, you have all of a sudden the inducement of cancerous cell growth, a maximization of the rate of growth of mito mitosis into very disharmonic proportions that cause uh, cancer. Whereas the other benzpyrene, the 1,2, uh, had no cancer, cancerous effects upon the cells that it was brought into proximity to. Um, their, their rate of mitosis maintained a healthy equilibrium. So this was a huge breakthrough that under, and a lot of people, they are aware of his breakthrough on a, on a, a chemical level, but the actual electromagnetic properties of uh, cells and cell growth that he was actually using in his mind 
and writing about, they ignore completely. So one thing, I, I just like this quote by Pop, where he said, every change in the biological field or physiological state of the living system is reflected by a corresponding change of its biophoton emission. So everything we have in life, it, our bodies are constantly communicating with itself. Every organ is communicating through light emissions as well as absorption. So this is very, very important. Um, and, and if you don't have that in, in your mind when you're thinking about nutrition, uh, health science, you know, obviously the foods we eat are, are, are themselves uh, it, being shaped by and shaping um, these light emissions. And it's not just in the, in the ultraviolet spectrum, although a lot of it is, but you have different aspects of this across the board, uh, across the, 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 the electromagnetic spectrum. I mean, not in the gamma rays and as far as I know, not in the radio frequencies, but, but you definitely have it in infrared. You have it in, in, in radio frequencies as well, actually. That's true, you do. Um, and you also have this, you have to think, between organisms as well, right? Um, how are, is the whole biosphere interacting with itself as one unit? Because not only are the individual organisms ha having communication internally, but you have them externally within the biosystem of the earth. That, that should be kept in, my, in your mind. And also water, right? Water seems molecularly the same, whether it comes out of your, your, your faucet or whether it comes out of a spring uh, in nature, um, whether it, has, it comes out of a bottle of Naya or whether there is um, cucumber or other fruit that have been put in the water does it, does it structure the water in a certain way according to the uh, signaling of these emissions? That's another question. Um, this is a low res, I couldn't find a good image, but I, I just wanted to bring this up because I just think it's so important and so synergistic with the discoveries being made by, by Gervich and Pop, but, um, and, and Berkelov. But uh, Dr. Luc Montagnier, um, made his own scandals in 2009 when he began publishing work that he had been doing on um, water memory and how certain, it, it was possible to set up certain situations where the DNA of various, various forms of DNA could be put into um, water that was then filtered eight, nine times to destroy all, eliminate all traces physically of the original DNA particles that were put in there. Um, his assumption was that in spite of that, there was something immaterial that was not, that was not in the physical DNA imparting information into the surrounding fluid. And he set up a test, an elegant test to see how that would work. And after um, filtering out that water, they were able to discover that you could still find a resonance of the original DNA, which had a certain frequency um, in that water that had been filtered out. Additionally, when you brought the DNA, the original DNA into proximity of the, uh, the, the, the filtered water, the filtered fluid that once had, but no longer has the DNA. And then you just put in, dropped in little organelles, little proteins into the, the nucleotides, into the, the empty current, the empty fluid, but, but kept them in proximity under certain constraints. Like he had to, to create a certain environment in the laboratory. You would be, surprisingly enough, these, these loose nucleotides would begin to, to form, to self-organize in the form of clones of the original DNA. So the water itself, the structure of the water did hold a memory and a resonance that organized the reformation of the nucleotides into, I mean, it's not exact replicas, it was like 97% similar, but damn close as far as self-organization is concerned. And it also forced us to reevaluate what is the real nature of life, because technically modern science tends to think of life as a purely material thing. Um, that this really challenges some of those core assumptions. The one thing I didn't say about this, though, is it, it only worked under one condition, that in the laboratory, there, the Schumann resonance of 7.8 hertz was activated. So if, that's, if the Schumann resonance was not activated, this effect of cloning did not occur. It was only when you had that background resonance that you got that inducement of that cloning of the DNA. So what is the Schumann resonance? I mean, this was something that we've only known for about a century is a resonance, a very low level resonance that's caused largely by the ionosphere of the earth and the earth's surface. That, that, and this is where the Schumann resonance is primarily located. Um, it's a certain electromagnetic 
uh, process, which is shaped and powered by primarily electric uh, lightning. So, I mean, all over the earth, there's hundreds of thousands of lightning bolts constantly happening every second. And this is creating a power source driving this, this, this resonance. Now this resonance, just like we found the quantization of the states of the, the quasar's redshift as it goes from a young seedling quasar into an older quasar, a more mature form of galaxy, um, we find the same type of quantization in the Schumann resonance. And, and it was given that name because it was discovered by, I think, a guy named Otto Schumann uh, in the 20s. Um, Winfred Schumann, anyway. Uh, and so the quantization we find occurs, these are three of them. There's actually several more. Uh, at the 7.83 hertz, 14.1 hertz, 20.3 hertz. Uh, I think there's a 24 hertz as well and a smaller one. But these are, these are things which are just, they're shaping the entire biosphere, right? And the fact that they also affect the behavior of DNA on the very small um, is very important. And the fact that these are also being shaped themselves, I mentioned the ionosphere. I mean, the ionosphere, this is the, uh, an Earth, uh, a space view of the, uh, of the aurora borealis. Um, that's really the sign of what we see when we see the aurora borealis is simply cosmic radiation coming in from intergalactic space or interstellar space um, into the Earth and interacting with the plasma of the ionosphere. And the ionosphere plasma is very big. Um, and it's something which has been tuning over time. One cannot say that the electromagnetic field that, or that the ionosphere are the same today as they were 100,000 years ago or a million years ago. You can't say that. There's a tuning, a fine tuning happening. What we do know is that as Vernotsky pointed out in much of his work, um, including especially the, uh, his, his famous writing on the biosphere, that the existence of what we think of as a lot of abiotic processes, uh, lithospheric non-living processes like, uh, like the ozone layer, is actually itself created by, by a slow accumulation of free oxygen emitted by life over time. And, and so you have here a self-reflective process where the, the overarching things like the, the ozone layer, which is itself interacting with the ionosphere, uh, which is itself interacting with what we have here is a broader image. This is an artist rendition, obviously, uh, but I like it of uh, the sun earth relationship, but that's the, what you have there is a picture of the Van Allen belts discovered, you know, last century, not even, I think 60 years ago, um, as these in nested fields that moderate the amount of dangerous, harmful cosmic radiation, uh, different forms of gamma radiation, uh, ultraviolet light that would normally do great damage to life living processes on the earth. These are being moderated by these different uh, nested fields. Uh, thank God, it would not be a place we'd want to walk around outside very much uh, without sunscreen if it were not for these amazing fields that were largely shaped by life itself. Um, another question that one might ask is, well, when looking at what planets are more likely to contain life, one might also take into consideration the existence of uh, free oxygen in the ionos uh, ozone layers or even magnetic fields, perhaps. Uh, it seems like these are all being affected by living processes. So life as a geological force. Um, so just keep in mind, you know, this entire process of the Earth-Sun relationship that, that's driving so much of the, of the processes on the Earth um, is itself part of a broader process. So just like the cells in our body are being organized by a deeper unity um, for a purpose, we, we find also that the suns within our, our own Milky Way solar system, and this again, artist rendition obviously, um, is a part of, what did I say before? Uh, estimates are between 100 to 400 billion suns are located within our Milky Way. We presume that we are uh, in the midpoint of one of the four primary arms, a small one of this Milky Way. I'm not too sure how they calculate that. Uh, so don't ask me if, if somebody like John or, or Martin knows, that's great. Um, but one rotation, one galactic year of our solar system's voyage is about 220 million years. So to, to make one voyage around the galactic center is about 220 million. I mean, and these numbers are open for debate. I know the way that we do our aging and dating is open for debate. It's not a, it's not an, a finished question, but I, we do definitely rotate around the center of this galaxy. 
Um, and at some points, uh, there's a team of scientists in Israel who did some interesting work um, looking at the different geological records. And uh, I've, it's been so long since I looked at their, their uh, paper, but they've done videos too. I got to review it. But they basically pointed out that there's evidence that we're not just going through the, the plane of the Milky Way, but that we're bobbing 30 million years below and 30 million years above, or in some process of moving, bobbing above and below. Um, if we don't feel comfortable with the exact numbers, 30 million per se or something, we could still say that according to the geological records that he was working with, that there is a process where we're moving for a period below and a period above the plane of the Milky Way. And at one point, uh, there's something more destructive happening and another there is not. So there's something to do with the air when we're orienting towards the Virgo cluster, um, which is a cluster of, of galaxies, a super cluster. There's radiations happening that somehow we don't know how cause damage. Uh, on the other side, we seem to be, we seem to find more protection to some of these life, anti-life processes. Um, this is one graph demonstrating um, in a very simplistic way, some of the cyclical anomalies that we've been able to sort of pick up over years. Um, again, don't worry about the time frame, 60 million, 30 million year cycles. Just consider the idea of biodiversity. We have seen that in the fossil records, there is biodiversity. Uh, spikes and decreases at different points. Systems uh, of, of life seem to blossom with interconnectedness as a system. And we have these extinction periods where in the fossil records, they disappear. And then we have a new superseding set of living species in fauna and flora that, are, that come into being in processes we don't know yet why or how, and that themselves then come into being. And we found about five or I think it's six great extinction cycles since the Precambrian period. And again, the relative dating, I think, is less important than the existence of the phenomenon as a quality. Um, we have other things like sen sen sedimentation rate, cosmic radiation influx, um, ice ages as well. Um, we have evidence of various ice ages being all being moderated by these longer term cycles. In what way they react or, or are driven by, we don't know. But we, we're just looking at connections here. That's all. Um, So that's just within this galaxy. But then additionally, we have to think, well, how is this galaxy being affected by the cluster of galaxies that we are a part of? The, the Milky Way itself is part of what's called the Laniakia, Laniakia, <laughs> uh, super cluster of galaxies. And it, it's a constellation of galaxies. We have no idea, really, honestly, how galaxies properly interact. What you're seeing there is the Abel cluster, 1689. Um, it's immense. We scientists estimate that there's something like 100,000 uh, galaxies within that particular supercluster that are all interacting together like cells in a body. Each cluster has almost like an organ organismic uh, quality to it. So that's another question. How is that happening? Why is that happening? Do, is there a purpose for the, uh, the galaxies to be where they are, uh, to be born when they are, and, and how the redshift or blue shifts are also causing there or indicating to us the different physical space times of each one relative to the other. So when we look again at Andromeda, we could either be like a, a nihilist or a, an existentialist physicist seeing the cause of our ultimate doom moving upon us someday soon. Uh, or or we, we could look at it with affinity, like a child would look at a mother and see that we have a parent galaxy that was likely the cause of what created all of the, the galaxies in our star cluster. Since this is the most blue shifted galaxy, this is the oldest galaxy um, that is visible in our cluster. Um, in all likelihood, it's not that it is blue shifted because it's racing towards, but rather that it's at a much more matured rate of, of development. And were we on Andromeda looking at the Milky Way, it would not be surprising if Helton Arp is right that we would find that the redshift of the Milky Way would not be blue, it would be redshifted uh, relative to our age. So that's pretty much what I have for that presentation. I went through a lot and I'm sorry if I, if I maybe hit on too many things, but I'm open for questions if people have any or thoughts. <laughs>